Hey, welcome back to another episode of Parker's Pensies. This is a podcast where we not only pronounce French words uh, wrongly, but we discuss philosophy, theology, nature, and life. I really love thinking about cool stuff, so come think with me. Before we get into today's topic, I just want to thank everyone on Patreon, all the patrons over there. You guys are huge. Uh, you're, every uh, patron is amazing. Every time I get that notification, it's always surprising. It's always awesome. I'd love to do this full time and bring you guys even better content. I'd love to start traveling more and doing interviews in person. Uh, I'd love this to be a full time gig. So if you guys have benefited from this podcast, please consider joining my Patreon team, uh, becoming a patron. You can find the link in the description. And uh, another way you can support this is to subscribe on YouTube and turn on the notification bell so you can see all the new episodes. Then above and beyond, this would be huge. If you go over to Apple Podcast and leave me a five star review and a comment, that would be really helpful. Today's podcast um, is going to be in nature, right? So it's philosophy, theology, nature, and life. It's usually philosophy, and then it's theology as well, philosophical theology. And a lot of you guys are here for the nature and the life, which doesn't come up that often. But I'm excited to say that today's episode will be in nature. I have a herpetologist with me, Seth Lagrange, the bearded biologist. This dude's awesome. Uh, right now, just pause this, whatever. Go follow him on Instagram. It's well worth it just to look at this dude's beard alone. Um, so without further ado, let me pull him in. Seth, thanks so much for coming on the podcast, man. Hey, thanks for having me, Parker. I appreciate it. I'm, I'm always a little bit timid uh, to have people who have better facial hair on uh, with me, <laughs> but uh, y- your beard is amazing, dude. H- how did that start? How did you become like the, the bearded biologist? <laughs> you know, well, first off, I got to commend you on your mustache. It's, <laughs> it's pretty nice, too. Um, yeah, I don't know. I've just always been able to grow facial hair. started, you know, having to shave when I was like 13 years old, so... Um, just something I've been able to do and I've gotten a lot of compliments on it and I figured why not have that kind of part of my persona, um, on, on Instagram. I was encouraged to start an Instagram cause I always love taking photos and things. And so I had to come up with a catchy name, right? So yeah, that's right. That's what I did. Uh, that's good, dude. So I, I, um, I, my logo here, I, uh, has the beard and the mustache, but at least the mustache. And so I've kind of like made myself into a caricature and I can't really even get rid of the, my, my wife loves the mustache now too, but I think it's probably similar for you, dude. If you shaved the, the must, the beard mustache combo, like you're not the bearded biologist anymore. Well, right. And it's funny because, um, I've had comments like that. They're like, well, but what if you shave or what if you want to shave it? And it's like, well, I just won't take a picture or, or, or myself at that point, right? It, it grows back pretty fast, but uh, yeah. I haven't been clean shaven in like I don't know eight years at this point. I don't, I don't think I think I'd look weird if I shaved it off. I may not keep it this long. Um, yeah, I'm doing. I don't know if you have noticed, but I'm doing a, a what's called a yeard this year. So it's a year long. Okay. Actually, there's a beard contest um, that I figured I might as well enter and give it a shot, um, dude. Yeah. Wait, so, when, when's that? Is that the at the like in December or something? Or yeah, so it actually ends in like January is the last. You have to upload a picture of your beard every three months. Um, you don't have to continue growing it out. It's just, do you have a beard for a year? Okay. And my goal was to not touch it essentially for a year. See what it looks like. I'm at six months, so we'll see. <laughs> That's awesome, man. I hope you win that. Yeah, it'd, it'd be great. Winter uh the winner of the best overall beard gets ten thousand dollars so dang okay granted wow. i'm probably competing with people who have like massive beards already so right but it was just something fun to do but dang, yeah. yeah that'd be insane well okay seth so you are the bearded biologist um how would you how'd you get into biology in the first place yeah so <laughs> i'm kind of one of those weird people who like started out when i was like I don't know, probably three years old, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, As soon as I could walk, I was catching snakes, uh, catching turtles. I I don't have a memory of of me not like having a pet turtle or something, you know? So I think a lot of that honestly comes from like my dad and my grandpa, uh, both very outdoorsy people. Um, And my grandpa always, he's actually a fifth grade teacher. So he always had a pet snake in his classroom. He was the guy in town that everybody, you know, contacted um, 
about like, what snake is this? Is this a copperhead kind of thing? Um, he would actually go to people's houses and collect snake eggs they'd find and hatch them and raise them and all that. So I have memories of doing that with him. And I think, you know, that it just kind of grew from there. Um, I have very early memory of asking him like, what is a person who works with reptiles and amphibians called, you know? Mm. And he said a herpetologist and I was like, okay, well, that's what I'm going to do. at like five years old or something. Yeah. Um, so it started really young and it kind of just continued. Um, I had pet herps my entire life, had a seven foot bow constrictor at one point, you know, okay. um, all through high school. And then I just decided I was going to go to college and study wildlife and the rest is kind of history at that point. Um, so. yeah. Cool. So you, you got your, what was your undergrad degree in again? It's actually a bachelor's in wildlife. Uh, okay. Yeah. So it's from Purdue and their forestry and natural resources department. They have you know, forestry, they have fisheries and wildlife. Um, so I went the wildlife route and yeah. Did you, so, did you get to, so I'm a big reptile amphibian. I'm, I'm a herp guy. I yeah. like wildlife. I like deer and stuff like that, but I can imagine going studying wildlife and studying things that's like, well, this isn't quite looking at snakes and reptiles. Was that like frustrating for you or, or you're like, no, nah, it's all wildlife is cool. Well, yeah. I, I mean, I would think I kind of like to consider myself more of a naturalist okay. uh, with herps as kind of like the top of the list as far sure. as my interests go. Um, but what was great about, you know, my major there is like essentially I had the, the mammologist taught mammalogy, the herpetologist taught herpetology, uh, the ichthyologist taught ichthyology. So I very early on got into a research lab as Dr. Rod Williams uh, herpetology lab at, at Purdue and, you know, worked in that lab, worked as a, as a field tech. I think it was the summer after my sophomore year. Uh, I actually worked on a hellbender project. Oh, so, sweet. Yeah. So uh, if, if your viewers don't know what a hellbender is, the one you should look it up because yeah. they're super weird and really, yeah. but they're uh, North America's largest salamander. They're fully aquatic. They live in these really nice streams um, under big rocks. So my first field job was swimming in a crystal clear stream, rocky stream, flipping rocks and pulling out these big salamanders. Um, so yeah, I mean, I enjoyed learning about wildlife in general and just you know ecology and and, and all that uh, but i i did very early on kind of get my my herpetology needs met if you yeah know. yeah that's good well yeah. seth uh did were you finding hell hellbenders in indiana do they have streams that are that clear and stuff for for them to thrive yeah so they're like everything i work with uh they're endangered and yeah. not doing very well um obviously Pretty much extirpated in in Illinois, having yeah, been um, for know, many many years, decades. Um, but yeah, in, in Indiana, they really only existed in one stream. Uh, it's the Blue River in southern Indiana. Um, wow. and it's it's like the last pristine river in Indiana. I would call it that. Um, but unfortunately, even while I was there, a the few years. Um, siltation was starting to to move in you know it's all the which is which is really bad for hellbenders right so it's right siltation is like runoff from ag fields if they're if the field goes all the way up to the stream uh it runs runs into the stream and covers up all the rocks and then then the stream becomes muddy and so it, sil siltation is still going on i would think that farmers were like keen to this now and and changing stuff <laughs> well um <laughs> Yeah, you would think that. Yeah. And, and it's gotten a lot better. I mean, okay. you know, there are a lot of farmers who do care about that and who do, you know, they have buffer strips and everything else. Um, and and I haven't been there in a while, so maybe it's it's improved and whatnot, but there were definitely spots where the field went literally right up to the stream, you know. Okay. So um yeah. It's, That's rough. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Uh but I I think it is getting better. Um, you know, hopefully. Yeah. Well, Seth, uh, real quick, when you grew up uh, with your grandpa, you know, looking for, for snakes and all this stuff, was that in Indiana or where, where are you from originally? Yeah. So I'm, I'm originally from Southern Indiana. Okay. Uh, actually, Santa Claus, Indiana, if you've ever heard of it. Uh-uh, but I should have. 
Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know if you should have. It's a tiny little, <laughs> tiny little town. Um, yeah, called Santa Claus. Um, if anybody watching knows Jay Cutler, who is the who was the uh, Bears quarterback for a long time. Yeah, um, he's from Santa Claus, Indiana. Okay, uh, she went to my high school, so that's maybe like yeah. Santa Claus's claim to fame. I don't know. Yeah, there, there's a theme park there um, called Holiday World that I that makes at. sense. Yeah, has yeah. to. So, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm from Southern Indiana, um, okay. which is I mean like 30 minutes from the Ohio River, Southern Indiana. Oh yeah, okay. So that's yeah. that's probably pretty nice. Is that pretty comparable to like Southern Illinois or? Yeah, yeah okay. it's pretty much pretty much the same, I would say. Um, Southern Illinois is probably a little bit more like Rocky Bluffs. Uh, okay. Southern Indiana kind of has that in places, but it's more just like rolling hills. But it's very similar. Uh, okay. Yeah. So then, so you went to I believe you went to Southern Illinois for your masters, right? Yes. Yep. And and what was that in? That's in Carbondale, Illinois. And, oh, sorry. Uh, the, the, what, what, yeah, what was the degree in? Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, it was in zoology, uh, just like general zoology. Um, so, yeah, I did okay. I did work while I was there. That was my master's was on herps too. So, yeah. But, yeah can, you, can you lay that out for us? Like, so uh, I just finished up a couple of masters in, in theology. I had to write a, a master's thesis, and it's like, a you know, basically writing a, a small little book. When yeah. it comes to um, getting a zoology, did you have to do like a capstone project or a paper or publish? Like, what, what does that look like? Uh, it's a it's a thesis as well. So okay. I did um, usually for like a master's in in my field, um, you're gonna do you're gonna have a, a project that you work on for like two to three years, um, mm -hmm. and out of that project, you should get two to three chapters, um, and they should all kind of relate, right? So. Yeah, you. That's kind of how it works. My master's. Um, I'll be honest, I did not enjoy. Um, okay. Yeah, me and <laughs> my advisor and I didn't really mesh super well, and it kind of. He kind of was. He kind of liked to jump from thing to thing to thing, and when you only have two ish years, that really uh, was a problem. So. Oh yeah, because yeah. you want to do like a deep dive on one thing and and, and figure stuff out. Right, right, and it, it makes it hard to really focus. Like if you're jumping from from different things, but um, and I also when I went there, I kind of told them I needed really needed two things, um, which was work with reptiles. <clears throat> actually, three things, preferably three things: work with reptiles, uh, have a field season because I like field work. Um, lab work is great if it's a component of your project, but I don't yeah. know if I'll be a lab project. Um, and preferably work with, you know, a listed species, a threatened or endangered species, right? So I, I like working in conservation. Okay. And uh, I ended up, my master's project ended up being a lab lab study um, on tad, wood frog tadpoles. Okay. Um, in a concrete block room with no windows. Yeah, man. So like kind of the complete opposite. Yeah. Uh, I really wanted, but in the end, you know, I got, I got my masters. So it is what it is. I mean, yeah, but yeah. So, well, you, frogs are cool. They're really cool. I was just going to bring that up. Yeah. I, I love, I love me some wood frogs, dude. It, it really sucks. I grew up in, in Chicagoland area. And so we got painted turtles and we got snapping turtles. Uh, every now and then you see a garter snake, right. but dude, I, I wanted to find wood frogs. I wanted to find uh, lots of soft shells and, uh, you know, different river turtles and stuff like that. And and every now and then I'd find like a random cooter and I'd be like, whoa, what, what is this doing here? But yeah. Chicago just sucks, man. The freaking talk saltation or you talk pollution, or you talk whatever. And it's like, these should be here. I read the books and I'm like, okay, Blanding's turtles. This is their, their uh, location. Spotted yeah. turtles, their range kind of comes into here too. All this wood frogs, man. And yeah. uh, just nothing because, because all this yeah. destruction. So I've been actually looking for wood frogs for a while. And yeah. people from Wisconsin laugh at me. They're like, bro, what are you talking? Like, we have wood frogs all the time. What are you talking about? It's like, yeah. Yeah, not here, man. Yeah. Yeah, the Chicago land area is tough. Um, it's like one of those things where you have to know, like, the spot to go. Right. Because there are, I mean, there are, there are some cool species up there. Yeah. Uh, if you know how to find them and where exactly to go. And, 
and wow. all the you have to you have to have that in too because people no one it's just like fishing like no one wants to tell you the spots and and it's actually really important because you tell someone the wrong spot and they go and they they harvest and they take all the the smooth green grass snakes then right. there's no more green grass snakes in chicagoland right and and that's the thing that's what i was going to say you kind of have to like a lot of those locations are pretty guarded especially because it's usually researchers who know yeah. where they are sometimes it's, it's just general herpers mm -hmm. um I do think, you know, as researchers, we need to make that connection. Definitely. I think it's funny um, because I was a herper when I was young before I ever knew that word. Right. Yeah, I didn't right. know the word for it. Um, <clears throat> and what I found in academia and doing this research stuff is like <laughs> academics, you know, scientists, researchers, they tend to like really, I don't know, they tend to not like herpers. Right. <laughs> for whatever reason. And I'm like, I get it, but we need to we need to bridge that gap because herpers know where stuff is. Yeah. They like they know where stuff exists. Like and they care because they want to show their kids. Yeah, they care, and they're they might be the next herpetologist. You know, yeah. so it was really funny to me. Like especially where I work now, there's a lot of people who are like, yeah, they just they don't like the herp community, and I'm like the herper community, and I'm like, okay, you need to get over that a little bit. Because like I was doing a project, for example, I was doing a project in Indiana uh, as a snake fungal disease project. And we were going all over the state looking for snakes, swabbing them for snake fungal disease. And we we're having a hard time finding snakes in numbers because snakes are hard to find. I mean, they yeah. just, they really are. Um, they're hard to sample for. Well, I went on Herp Mapper. I contacted, you know, the, the admin of, Herp mapper and was like, Hey, I'm a scientist doing this research. Can I have, you know, access to locations? And essentially the Herper community did my work for me. I yeah. looked at those locations, went to those spots and found snakes. Um, so that's, that's always interesting to me. Like you're talking about, you know, hiding your, your locations and, and everybody being secretive. And it's like, yeah, be wary of who you give those locations to, Yeah, but we're not against each other. You know? Right. Well, I think that's, that's huge too, because like a, a scientist, someone you can trust, especially looking at fungal disease, looking at um, wh whatever's coming through, looking at populations, they're the guys you want to trust, the guys and gals who are looking out for the species. And the herpers that I know are, they, they love this. They're just, they're just amateur herpetologists. They, they know all the Latin names. They know all the stuff. They haven't put in the work. They don't know the lab kind of stuff either. But yeah, that connection is, is really huge for the survival of the species. Um, and I, I think uh, uh, herpers do a good job of of passing that on to kids. And so like uh, I'm, I'm an amateur herper. I have a whole turtle and frog room and I set it up for kids because I want my my nephews, my nieces, my, my kids, hopefully when I when we start having some to come in there and just their eyes to explode. And they'll say, well, you know, this is an alligator snapping turtle. I want to go and study that. You know, I want to whatever. And it's just the next generation. Hopefully each generation loves animals a little bit more and is a little bit smarter about caring for them. Right. And, and that's something like you said that, you know, scientists and stuff, we should foster that because amateur herbers are doing some of that work for us. Mm -hmm. um, so, I'm hoping we can recognize that. Um, unfortunately, there's also herpers who have had a bad run in with, you know, some scientist somewhere who's yelled at them for being in a place. And then so then they they don't you know, it's just it's an interesting dynamic uh, that I've that I've realized. And I'm like, you know, you need to be better about this for the well, exact reason you just said, because, yeah, yeah you're, you're going to teach people. You're going to teach your kids. You're going to teach nieces and nephews, neighbors, whatever about about your passion. And mm -hmm. we need more people to be passionate about it. For yeah. Sure. Well, I think that's, what's cool about you is that you're a herper turned herpetologist. Uh, can you just like, is there a, is there a day in the life or like a week in the life? Is there an average thing that you, what do you do as a, as a professional herpetologist? Um, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a good question. There's not really an average day in the life, I guess, um, you know, during field season. So starting in like early March through October, I tend to be in the field a lot. Um, whether that's, you know, starting in March, um, we'll go down and look for Massasauga rattlesnakes. Uh, it's a project okay. the Illinois Natural History Survey has been working on for like 20 plus years now. Um, 
So I'm kind of in charge of that. So March, April, a little bit of early May, I'm, I'm down there looking for, for Massasaugas like all day, um, yeah. five days a week. Um, and then, you know, like I brought up about the tollway stuff, um, it kind of depends a little bit on what the tasks are for that year. Mm. Uh, so just to like, yeah, give everybody a, a background, a lot, like most of my salary is paid through the Illinois tollway, um, which seems a little bit, you know, like selling my soul, right? It's kind of more like consulting for this big entity that does destroy <laughs> habitat sometimes. But I'd rather, you know, us do that than just some consulting firm who totally is just going to take the money and say, oh, yeah, this is what we found, whatever. So we actually, you know, are going to hopefully inform them correctly and actually work hard to if there's a blanding turtle there, we're going to work really hard to find that blanding turtle so that, you know, they have to they have to worry about it, essentially. Um, well, I, I, I'm actually super encouraged by that, that, that because, uh, man, I use the Illinois tolls, all the, the tollways all the time and freaking all sorts of dead animals all the time. And it's just cool to know that, hey, they've got people working on it. And it's not just like their tollway guy. It's a herpetologist who's coming through. And if yeah. you find like if you find a blandings, things things are going to happen. Like you're going to make a fence or whatever. You're going to have to make some changes because that is a protected species. Um, I, I think that's actually really encouraging. I know some people could think, well, you're working for the tollway. Yeah, but you're working for the tollway in order to say, hey, here's the effect that this tollway has, or here's how we can mitigate those effects. So yeah, the way I think about it is the tollway might be paying my salary, but I'm not beholden to the tollway. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'm going to tell totally. them the truth and they're going to take that information and do what they need to do. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's no, there's no, uh, pressure to, to lie in any mm -hmm. way. Um, because they don't, they don't want to kill a blanding turtle either. Right. Because if it turns out that they do, that's more, <laughs> that's way worse right. uh, for them than just mitigating for it originally. Yeah. But uh, yeah, but each year it depends on where they're doing work. Right. So if they're going to redo a road somewhere or build a road or you know, whatever, uh, they'll have to have us kind of go back to that area and sample again, just to make sure, hey, there's nothing new that we find. Um, so that kind of changes from year to year a bit. Like this year, you know, we're going back and doing uh, kind of like a follow-up at a couple of different sites because they've done some some restorations, which mm -hmm. that's the thing that, that they do, that the tollway has paid for is restoring certain areas and stuff, which is great. Um, and we're kind of looking at how those restorations have done. Um, are we finding you know, more animals there. Um, mm -hmm. So that's kind of this year. It's pretty intensive this year, but like next year, I already know what my tasks are and it's actually not herpetology. Okay. Uh, I actually, so like I said, I'm, I'm more of I like to think of myself as more of a naturalist. Mm -hmm. so I actually um, can ID a lot of plants. And if you followed me on Instagram a little bit, you, you might've seen some of my stories where I talk about prairie plants and different stuff. Um, I can ID trees. So one of the things that the toy worries about is bats. Obviously bats are kind of a big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'll go up and actually look for bat roost trees. So some bats will roost in the barks, bark of trees, like shag bark mm -hmm. and stuff. Yeah. So I'll go and walk around really nice forest preserves and like hug trees all day. Right. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Every tree, every tree I take a DBH of, which literally you just wrap around. So I would say, if people saw me, they'd, they'd probably be like, I think it's a little funny because I am literally out there like hugging. Oh, that's tree. hilarious, dude. Yeah, yeah, you're literally a tree hugger. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, that's... so yeah, I mean, it. the day in the life will change a little bit from year to year or what project, you know, maybe we have coming down uh, the pipeline and stuff. But it kind of flip flops from field work in like the active season to just like office, office type work from november to february and that might that's usually writing reports so mm -hmm. reports of stuff we've done this whole year um getting that to reports for grants that we have so we always have to like report on what we've done for that grant reports to the tollway obviously um mm -hmm. that kind of stuff writing grants writing papers um you know that kind of stuff like trying to get more money <laughs> yeah usually yeah 
Yeah. Well, Seth, do you do you have a do you have a position somewhere? Are you based out of like U of I or something? Or yeah, yeah. So I I work for the Illinois Natural History Survey, um, okay. which is under the umbrella of the University of Illinois. Okay. It's kind of it's kind of weird how it is. So like, I'm in a I'm in a specific research lab, um, and then that lab we're all hired by the Illinois Natural History Survey, mm-hmm. who is under the Prairie Research Institute, who is under the University of Illinois. So it's okay. like all these layers of like administration, essentially. Yeah. Which is, which is great. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> Well, it's awesome that the, that you get to do what you do, even with all those, you know, yeah, the bureaucracy and the levels and and all that good stuff. So, um, in in like the circles that I know better, philosophy, theology type stuff, there's there's like a publisher parish kind of thing. You have to the the academics have to continually be pumping out papers, uh, otherwise they perish. Is is there anything like that in in your line of work? Like, do you? I know the the research grants are probably really big, writing those, but do you have to? publish uh, articles to continue being respected or continue having your job or or what's the deal on that? Yes and no. Um, I've not published a lot here recently or really at all um, in my career, just because I am fairly fairly new in my career. Okay. It's going to be, you know, that's still the case. If you're a professor, you know, if you have a research lab and you're trying to get tenure, yeah, it's like you got to publish, 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 publish. Okay. Grants and all that stuff. Since my job, that's part of my job description. It's something that I should probably do more of. Um, but since my job is paid mostly through the, the Illinois Toy, which is a five-year grant, you know, and we get it like every five years, um, it's my job is less. I would say, I guess, I would say my job is, is fairly secure in that, even if I don't publish a ton. Um, yeah. So, which is nice, you know, there's not that added pressure of always, you know, trying to pump out a bunch of papers. Um, I've had, I've had a couple since I've been here. We're working on, we're actually working on one right now about alligator snapping turtle basking behavior. Yes. Which is, which is cool. Yeah. Um, and there'll be, a, the, more, the longer I'm here, the more I'm going to be on other things and, and I'll get those publications, but it's not like they're not going to fire me essentially. <laughs> You're right. Um, yeah. Like, oh, you, you didn't publish enough. So. Yeah. Well, that's cool because it, it is, it is a weird expectation to think that someone who is a, uh, a lab tech or, or who is out in the field, a field, what, what do you call you guys? Someone who's out in the field all the time. Um, so my, my actual title, uh, is a, is a wildlife ecologist or a okay. field, you could say a field ecologist. Yeah. Um, field ecologist. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So someone who's like a lab tech or a field ecologist, the expectation that you would be able to write uh, journal articles is like, it's a little bit weird. Well, why is, why would there be trans translation there? I understand you have to publish your work to show that you're doing work, but yeah, that, that is a little bit like, okay, the two don't really have any connection to each other. So I, yeah. I'm, I'm glad that it's not an insane amount of pressure on that. Yeah. Yeah. Especially for like, you know, especially with the tollway work, there's not really, there's not really going to be a publication, a scientific journal article that could be written about that unless we're doing, we specifically go into that thinking, okay, we have to do this work, but we're also going to take this data, uh, these data to, to write a paper. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, being in the field all the time, like that much, it does make it hard to like, to write a paper and, and all that stuff and keep up on that. Um, but I guess that's what winners for. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah. So, well, Skim, I just want to talk real quick about like the relationship between conservation and, and biology. Um, there, and also maybe the relationship between you and like the, the forestry guys, the, uh, I always see them all around here. I live in Lake County. I used to live in DuPage County and, uh, you got the, the forest rangers and stuff like that. And, uh, if you look up surveys at, at lakes around here in Lake County, a lot of them are done by, uh, by the Lake County forest preserve, uh, guys. Mm-hmm. I don't know if they're necessary. I think they're their own thing. I don't know that they're herpetologists or ichthyologists or anything like that. What's, do you guys do work with those guys or is there like beef and it's like, Hey, this is my turf or what, what's the relationship with, with those kind of guys? No. So we work with them a lot. Um, so actually the two places that I'm trapping right now, um, are two different 
nature preserves, they would be under the forest preserve. So a lot of times those each one has like a biologist that works there. They're part of the, you know, they're hired by the forest preserve district or whatever uh, that county. Um, and they'll do surveys. Uh, they might consider themselves a herpetologist. I mean, you know, as far as that goes, I mean, if you work with herps primarily, you can call yourself a herpetologist. Okay. Like, um, That's they, cool. You're not stingy like that. Yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> I would say I'm, I, I don't like, I don't like people putting, putting me in a box. So I'm not going to, I'm going to say that somebody else has to, can, you know, has to be a certain way to say they're a herpetologist. They study it. Hey, you do you, you know, you be, you can call yourself a herpetologist as far as yeah. I'm concerned. And, and even an amper, amateur herper like yourself, if, if, you're contributing in some way to science, you know, you're kind of a herpetologist as well. That's but, uh, cool, man. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, yeah, we work with those guys a lot or, you know, uh, those people a lot. Um, as far as beef, Oh, there's always beef. I mean, that, <laughs> that's what, uh, I shouldn't say always, but I mean, older academics and stuff, they, they tend to make enemies. A okay. lot. I'm down here trying to like navigate all that and be like, Hey, I, I just, I just want to do this, this survey. Like I'm not trying to make anybody mad, but yeah, like I feel like older academics who've been around for a while or professors, whatever they, I don't know, they tend to, they tend to make enemies and burn bridges, which isn't great. Right. It isn't great for us when like that person may be somewhat associated with me. Higher yeah. Up. Yeah. And then, yeah. So-and-so is like, Oh, you work with them. No, you're not, I'm not working with you kind of thing. Yeah. But no, we we do that a lot. Um, kind of ha- kind of has to happen because uh, most of our stuff occurs on like public lands, so you're always going to be dealing with like a, a land manager. You know, works for the DNR, looks works for you know forest reserves, whatever. So, well, okay. So, will like the will the DNR ever um, hire you guys like to come out and help with a survey or to do a survey? Um, yeah, not not kind of. I guess not in the way that you would say that you would think like hiring us. So we yeah. usually get grants, okay. right? So a lot of our work, like the Massa Sagas, um, the alligator snapping turtles, that's all through the DNR. So they'll either have a grant announcement, like, Hey, we want to do this work. And, you know, maybe we'll write a proposal and get that grant through the DNR. Sometimes they, they know, they know who we are and they'll be like, Hey, <laughs> you guys work with Blandings we need you to do this blandings work. Do you want to do it? Hmm. Um, so it's kind of like that sometimes. Um, so I guess you could say they hire us kind of, um, by giving us money to do the work. Okay. But yeah, it's usually through grants. Um, yeah. That's awesome. Well, this whole thing is, has helped me a little bit with, uh, with the tolls. Like every time I go through a toll, I'm thinking, well, now Seth's getting a, a little bit more here. That's great. So I don't have to feel as bad about it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've been the same way. Like when I've went to Chicago since being here, I'm like, well, I'll pay this toll, I guess, whatever. It's coming back to me at some point. So. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, okay. So when it comes to like, when it comes to conservation, um, how can, how can like the, the, how can lay people get involved? How can people, I know there's with, uh, I want to talk blandings a lot. I love, absolutely love blandings. Uh, it's becoming my new favorite turtle, even above alligator snappers. But um, I, so I know there's certain like adopt a turtle kind of things we could talk about, but can people, do you ever recruit people to help with like, like uh, river cleanup or with, with surveys or anything like that? Um, I don't specifically like do that, but uh, yeah, that's one way I was going to say is like helping with cleanup, you know, getting involved in that is great. Um, there's obviously like nowhere on earth now that humans have not impacted. So everywhere that i go i mean when we're catching alligator salmon turtles there'll be big log jams and upstream of that log jam it's just like 20 feet of like styrofoam cups and bottles and things so like we need we need cleanup uh big time that that'd be a big one um yeah as far as helping with surveys um Unfortunately, a lot of times it's not really up to me. It's kind of more of like, it depends, especially if we're working with an endangered species. Um, so like for the alligator salmon turtles, for example, I've had, I've had a lot of people, you know, in Southern Illinois who've been like, Hey, can we come out and help, you know, with the recapture or whatever? And I'm like, that'd be cool. Um, I'd love for you to get to do that, but 
someone in the DNR has to say, yeah, that's okay. Okay. Most of the time it's going to be like, mm, you know, cause they're not hired by any, by a certain entity. Uh, like we said about locations and things. It's yeah. That's so- a really big one. And you, you don't, you don't really know too, especially if it's just a cold call. Someone's just saying, it's like, right. you could be a poacher looking for the spots and it's cynical, but it's also important to think that way about the, the safety of these animals. Right now, granted with the alligator snapping turtles, I mean, they could throw out a trap, I guess, but like, as far as somebody going and like just finding them, yeah, they, well, not not where not where we are. Right, not south, sure, maybe, but um, but yeah, a lot of times what we like to do if somebody's going to help, somebody's going to like come and help us. They're already they're like an undergrad somewhere working, you know, in a lab or they're they're working towards their biology degree. Yeah. They got to get hours. Do you have to log a certain amount of hours or something too for your for your uh, undergrad? No, not really. I mean. I think if you want to be like a certified wildlife biologist, there's, there's criteria Okay. Uh, maybe, but like, I think what's really important for undergrads in this field. And it seems crazy is just getting as much experience early on as you can. Yeah. Because crazy, like it's, it's kind of crazy, but uh, this feels super competitive, you know, um, hmm. even though it doesn't pay that great and mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's hard work and you might have to travel all over, the country, which to some people is awesome. Um, there's a lot of people who want to work with wildlife and there's just not a lot of jobs yeah. because, you know, a lot of people love animals, but from the top down, sending money towards that is not always the thing that we do. You know what I mean? So that's not- bonkers to me, dude, because I'm, I, I'm, I lean a little bit more libertarian. And so I like, don't really like taxes, but if taxes are going to go anywhere it's like dude are you see like and that's that's a big part of what i want to do i want to i want to get all these kids to love animals so they're not polluting because this bottle might go down and, and mess with the alligator snapping turtle or uh if they become legislators hey we're going to allocate some money to this and we need more biologists seriously like people are all concerned about global warming well, yep. put your money where your mouth's at and hire some more freaking biologists and herpetologists and ecologists and ichthyologists. Like, let's go. Right. So that was actually going to be uh, something I was going to say about how, you know, general people can get involved in conservation and that's voting for people who care about it. Now yeah. it's tough to know. I mean, a lot of times politicians say what they're, what they need to say. Right. But if, if we continually show that, Hey, we care about this, this is an issue that, that the majority of people care about, they're going to have to start listening and, and, and doing something about it. So yeah, voting um, for people who will actually change something. Um, but also um, you brought up a good point and that's reducing pollution. That's doing your part as just an individual in your household to try and reduce your single use plastic. Mm-hmm. So try and, just be a little bit greener, um, you know, and there's a lot of ways to do that. And you can look up tons of different things about that. And you'll find way more than you want yeah. to know. Um, I will say, I think it's funny. I think that's one thing where conservationists, and environmentalists um, kind of go and do a little bit of overkill. We like bombard people with, hey, do this, do this, do this. You know, and people are like, I can't do all this. It's just you shut off. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what I always say is like, just pick a thing. Like if, if, if you're going to say, you're like, you know what? I can, I can uh, stop using plastic bags at the grocery store. I can take a bag, you know, reusable bag. Yeah. Just do that. Try that. And once it becomes routine, then you can try another thing. Yeah. Um, but I think we, unfortunately we like say you have to do this and you have to do this and you have to do this. And or you're a terrible person yeah. Uh, yeah, or you're a terrible person. It's like, no, they're not, they're not a terrible person. They've just been living this way, you know, for so long. It's like give people some steps, but you know, if, if you're, yeah, if you're just a general person who wants to help with conservation, just, you know, try and try and just be a little bit greener in some way that you can. Yeah. And and make it known that hey, you care about this. You know, you care about conservation. Try and get involved with the citizen science project, or you know, try and volunteer somewhere, or you know, go talk to the naturalist at your state park and say, hey, how can I help? Um, and then vote for people who care about it. Yeah. So 
Yeah. So we've been talking a lot about Illinois because because you live here, I live here. I hate this state and love this state. Um, I'm I'm a prairie guy. I actually really like prairies. Um, I like the the plants like like you're talking about. Um, but but for those who are listening out of state, like my audience is all over the place. Uh, do what Seth said. Like get get involved. Get to know your your local people. Um, that that's huge. For someone, I would love to see like this this platform. My my channel isn't huge yet, but it's growing and it's growing. If you're, if you're if you are a well off person and you're looking for even like tax incentives or something, set up a grant. Figure out how to set up a grant. I'm sure that's tax deduct deductible. And freaking set up a thing and say, hey, I want this money to go to Blanding's Turtle. See if you can make that happen. I'm, I'm, you have to negotiate and stuff, but say, hey, if I'm going to give you money, it's going to go where I want it to go. See if you can set set up a, a research, research grant or uh, some kind of fund, whatever, and put your money there and see people like Seth getting to work. And maybe yeah. they'll send you pictures or something, too. Who knows? Right. And I'm actually glad you brought that up uh, about, like, you know, people who are well off or whatever, because... I don't know if this is cynical or not, but like anymore, I, I feel like one of the best ways to do actual conservation or the only way to really do conservation nowadays is to buy land. Yeah. So yeah, if you're someone who has expendable income, um, buy some land and protect it or, or donate some money to have land bought or donate land to the DNR. Um, you know, if you can, because when we, if we talk about, you know, these turtle species like blamings and, and alligator snappers and spotted and, and really most endangered species, the biggest issue is habitat loss. Yeah. It's, it's habitat loss and fragmentation, you know, and until we protect it all, it's just going to keep disappearing. Mm -hmm. um, we need to protect what's there and then we need to add, you know, add stuff. So if, if you can buy an old ag field somewhere, uh, buy it and convert it back, restore it or whatever. Um, that would go, that'd be huge. That would go a long way, uh, towards conservation because yes. they're not making any more land. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's the biggest, that's the biggest issue for most species is yeah. habitat loss. So. so there's a, there's a huge fen. I don't want to give away my location too much. There's a huge fen, uh, where I live. And, if I didn't care for spotted and blandings, I would be like this freaking eyesore. You know, when when it all when it all dries up, all the cattails turn brown. It's like this is gross looking. But I know about I know about blandings. I know about spotted. I know that's where they're living. And so for me, I'm like that's awesome, dude. I can't believe there's a huge fen here. I might see something. I might you know I'm I always go for a run by the fen because I want to see, especially in June. Maybe maybe I'll see something come up. It's always painted turtles, but they're cool too. Yeah. I think that's that's kind of part of it too. the education saying like, here's where they live. And I know that you guys think this is a slew that this is gross and it's just going to be mosquitoes and you're going to get some kind of disease. This is actually where these cute little turtles live. And if you turn this into another parking lot, you, it's not just you're going to kill them. They're not going to be able to live anywhere They're You're pushing them out into the road, wherever. And I, I think that's another important aspect because Chicagoland is all swamps and people don't really recognize that because you've paved over everything. But it used to be this this really nice swamp. I think if you can start to like swamps a little bit more because of the animals that live in there, you might appreciate the fen a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if everybody knew what a blaming turtle looked like, I feel like they would definitely want to protect those areas yeah. because, like you said, they are probably one of the cutest turtles I've ever seen with their little yellow chin and their constant smile. So it's yeah. like – and that's one of the things that I – you know I try and do with my Instagram account is just like, Hey, show people these animals and say, Hey, this is where they are. This is what we need to do. You know? Um, because a lot of people, they don't even think about it. They, like you said, they drive by and they go, oh, that's ugly, you know, mosquitoes or ticks yeah. or whatever. And it's like, yeah, you're not wrong, but there's also these other things that need that. Um, you know, yeah. not everything lives in like a perfectly manicured monoculture lawn. Right. You know, um, right. so yeah. Well, um, oh shoot, I just lost it. But that's that's a oh the fen kind of stuff too. I think from a practical standpoint, like hey, look, you don't want your basement to flood. Okay, well, preserve that fen and don't turn it into a grass uh, spillway or whatever. Put you need the spongy plant life and stuff to suck all that up, yep. or you're gonna get water in your basement. There's no, it's no surprise that everyone in Chicagoland gets gets water in their basement. You live in a swamp. It's all clay. 
and there's nowhere for that water to go and be sucked up by the plants. And we've diverted it all into, you know, one area and we've made all these impermeable surfaces. Yeah. The parking lots. So yeah, it all has to go somewhere. And yeah. as we was, I mean, as we were saying, Nate, you're never going to beat nature. Nature has created things to handle that. And yeah, yeah one of those is a swamp, a fen, you know, a floodplain. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why they exist. Um, and yeah, if we just destroy it. It's just going to get worse. So. Yeah. Well, okay. Here's another question. I don't know how much you know about like Chicago land area stuff, but all there's, I look at uh, like Greg's Turtle Haven. I look at I look at your Instagram. I, all these Instagrams, and I'm, it's really hard not to be jealous because I'll see sometimes you guys in, in these really clear streams. We don't have any of that. It's all it's all completely like silted up or mud or whatever. And I wonder how much of that is natural. Like, is that just the Chicagoland area? Their mud creeks, or is that because the, all the smooth surfaces and all the water, like it's siltifying a ton? Yeah, I, I don't know a lot about the history of Chicago land streams, but I'm assuming that most of it's not natural because pretty much everything's been channelized, right? Okay. Uh, we've, we've channelized a, a lot of our streams and that's the issue with where we have alligator snapping turtles. It's not a, it's not natural anymore. Uh, it was channelized back in like the fifties or something. Okay. And channelizing those streams um, leads to, I would say more siltation, more mud uh, because when you have just a straight shot, yeah. Everything just getting washed in and washed down and destroyed. Whereas usually a stream meanders and there's slow, slow parts and deeper parts. And it's, it's more of a, you know, it's, it's dynamic. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know, but I would assume that a lot of those probably at this point aren't fully natural. Yeah. Um, whether or not they were, you know, nice Rocky clear streams, I don't know, but yeah. Um, yeah. They're probably, okay. They probably had things done to them and they definitely had things, you know, water diverted to them, yeah. which has increased probably, you know, runoff and siltation and, and everything else. So, okay. Yeah, that, that definitely makes sense. Well, uh, I, I thought maybe we could close up here uh, in our last part of this conversation with, with some turtle talk. We've kind of broached it around because I love them so much, but um, I want to talk maybe blandings first. Cause that's a little bit, well, let's no, let's go alligator snappers first. Cause that's more sad. And then we'll we'll end with the happy blandings. So um, everyone thinks that they they've caught or they've found an alligator snapping turtle. Most of you in the whole country have not. It's an it's a common snapping turtle. It's not even a Florida snapping turtle because they're in a specific part. And common snapping turtles are awesome. That's okay. They're really fun actually. They're really uh, they got a crazy temper and stuff. But it's not an alligator snapping turtle. However, there are like some naturally occurring ones in in southern Illinois. Can you can you tell us about that? Yeah. So like you said, um, if you've, got, if you've got a snapping turtle, it's most more than likely it's a common snapping turtle, which, uh, like Parker said, is awesome. Common snappers are sweet. I love them. They're feisty and everything else, but, um, yeah, alligator snappers in Illinois, it's always their history. A lot of it's up for debate at this point, whether or not, you know, there was ever a functioning population here. Mm -hmm. Um, but there were native native turtles. There were tur resident turtles, I guess what we call them. Now we've actually uh, done a reintroduction project, started, they started releasing turtles back in 2014. I came onto that project in 2016. Um, so yeah, there, there are alligator snappers out there in, in a stream in Southern Illinois, which is pretty cool. Um, during that project, it was before me, um, they actually captured a resident turtle, a turtle that was not one of the turtles they released, uh, yeah. which is awesome because that's the first resident alligator snapping turtle found in Illinois in 30 years um, yeah. at the time. So that's 2014. So, do you do you think is it possible someone got that from Loggerhead Acres and, and put that in there, or it's possible? And that that's that was the you know there's always that debate too where people are like ah it was somebody's pet and it's like well maybe but we maybe don't not. know. Yeah. yeah, not. Um, unfortunately, at the time, I actually put a transmitter on it. But unfortunately, at the time where we were getting the transmitters from, they weren't the best and the transmitter like died. Within a month. So, yeah, that's usually how it goes. Now the transmitters we get, they last like three or four years, depending on the size of them. So we would have had that turtle on air for a long time, which would have been really cool to see. Like, where is it going? What is it doing? We could have maybe determined, was it a pet or not? Um, 
we did take a genetic sample and I, and I think we haplotyped it. So it was the right haplotype. Oh, uh, awesome. Area. So okay. that, that leads you to believe that, you know, maybe it, maybe it was a resident turtle. Of course, somebody could have easily had that as a pet and it would have been the right haplotype. Well, uh, wait, is that, is that haplotype the same as like the ones in Louisiana or? Yeah. So, uh, haplotype is kind of like, like the Mississippi river drainage uh -huh. has a certain haplotype. Um, it's just something to do with their genetics. And then of course now the alligator snappers have been split into three species, right? Yeah. So, the swanius and yeah. So those will be other haplotypes. So you can do genetic work, work on it and determine like, should this even be here? Kind of right. thing. So we, we get confiscations sometimes to release. So we always have to check like, would this be the right, the correct genetics for this area? So, so, um, yeah, that's, that's an interesting point. So if you did get a confiscation swanius, which is super rare, they're really rare turtles, probably no one's owning those. If they did, it's definitely illegal because they're protected. Right. You're, you're not going to release that into the Illinois stream. No. Yeah. Just cause no. we don't want to do any non-natural, non-native kind of stuff. Right. You know, and you'd want to put that, um, if they release it, you want to put that back where it belongs in it. In okay. Relation, right um yeah. that's just you know from a scientific aspect that's kind of the thing we try and do is like yeah. keep the genetics the way that they should be um that's so, really cool that you so you know how to do the lab work on that too like you can take a sample and you can and you can see that or is that someone like a lab tech who's job um, is? i could figure it out i mean i've done like uh qpcr genetics type stuff um but we tend to send that off to to a lab to okay. somebody who does that more often. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, but actually, you know, we, we have gotten confiscations um, kind of going on that, those big, like the really big turtles um, on my account, yeah. those are actually a comp. They were all from one confiscation. This guy in Florida had 18 of these big alligator sandwich turtles. I mean, between, between like 35 and 75 pounds, wow. 18 of them between that size. So, I don't know where he kept them all or how, how he did it, but um, he actually had a permit and then didn't renew his permit. So then they got confiscated. We have oh, yeah. uh, obviously being from Florida, it was kind of like, you know, we had to make sure that they were right. And we haplotyped them and they were right. And uh, we actually released them all, which was great uh, yeah. to have big, big adults. Cause usually the ones that we were releasing were like maybe, you know, this big to that big, they weren't huge. So. And even with a transponder, like good luck finding that's that's tough to find that size turtle alligator snapper especially but you get a big giant one you get a 80 pounder a little bit easier to find right right um well and the thing about it is and this kind of will probably lead us to our you know maybe our little sad story is that throwing those out there you're like well nothing's going to kill these right they're they're going to be there as long as they don't take off south and go into the mississippi river and and go down south they're going to live there. There's nothing that's going to kill them um, except for one species. Yeah. Uh, right. And whereas like a lot of the other ones, I mean, we find dead turtles all the time. Yeah. You know, it's raccoons. There's otters in this stream. Um, like I said, it's channelized. So if we get a big rain, the water just rushes. Um, and you think a little turtle like that gets washed downstream, gets buried in mud, whatever. Um, so we tend to find a lot of those, Little turtles, a certain percentage of them will die each yeah. year, which is no fun. It's like sixty uh, percent or something make it. Or that's like a good number. Um, as far as the the alligator snipers, I'm I'm not sure what the okay. percentage is for us. It's I would say sixty percent would probably be pretty generous. Okay. Uh, huh. For this for this population, we just I'd I'd have to I'd have to ask. Um, Ethan, he he actually did his dissertation on us. He has all that all that data. So sweet. Okay. But yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah, can we get in? I think the the sad story is gonna be really sad, but I hope hopefully it stops it from happening again. Right. Uh, and yeah. I just followed it on your Instagram story, and it was rough. I, the first time I read it, I had to stop reading because I I really love these animals, and I had to read it again. Just I'm like, all right, I need to know what happened here. Right. Um, yeah. So that week, so every I think I mentioned earlier, you know every spring and every fall we do a recapture so the turtles that have transmitters on them will go out and we'll actually dive for these turtles um the water is chocolate milk i mean it's as soon as you dive under it's pitch black can't feel anything i can't see anything you're just feeling around in the mud 
Um, you kind of have to just like turn your brain off when you're doing <laughs> and just be like, I'm just feeling a turtle. It's fine. Um, so we do that in the spring and the fall. And this year's 2019, um, down there, they had a huge flood. Um, in that area, they've had like two or 300 year floods in the past five to 10 years. It's not. Wow. Um, so we had a huge, huge flood. Uh, roads were flooded. We couldn't get down there in the spring. So we got down there in the fall, tons of dead turtles to pick up. Um, you know, so by the end of the week, it was just, we were just really discouraged, right? You know, it's, we're finding more dead turtles than live turtles. Um, that's just a, that's just a function of we weren't there in the spring to pick up those dead turtles, right. uh, you know, so it's like a whole year's worth. Um, so by about Thursday, we're like, okay, like we're going to go find the big ones. You know, they're not going to be dead um, because they're big. Um, we went after the 80 pound, I think he's like 75 to 80 pounds at the time. He's the biggest one we released. Like we'll go get him. We've recaptured him. We actually had recaptured him. I think every, every recapture or almost every recapture since releasing him. Mm -hmm really cool you know to get to recapture that big guy and make sure he's doing well you know check him out and everything uh, make sure he's growing eating so he went after me and he was way downstream uh he actually had hung out way up at, at the top of the stream where we released like the first release point for a long time so he's way downstream we get down there i'm i'm diving i'm in my wetsuit i'm walking along the bank with two other people who were with us helping out and Ethan was in, Ethan was in the kayak tracking. And as I'm walking along, um, I see he's starting to pinpoint, you know, the area. And I kind of look across on the other side. And I, at the time I couldn't tell what it was, but I saw something sitting there and I was like, Oh man, I was like, I hope that's not a big turtle shell. And the people with me, they're like, Oh, I don't, I don't think so. I, I don't think it is. And so I dive in, I jump in and Ethan's like, I think it's right here. So I'm feeling around the mud and I'm like, if there's an 80 pound turtle here, I should be feeling this turtle. Like yeah. it's either just a transmitter or he's not there. Um, and it was, there's like a big cut bank right there. So when we're, when we we're down on the water, you couldn't really see the bank. Mm -hmm. So I was like, hold on. Um, and I climbed up and peeked over and I see a four foot hoop trap leaned up against a tree and just a pile of bones. I mean, a pile. Um, and right next to it is the big shell and lined up are like six alligator snapping turtle skulls. So they had looked through it and found these turtle skulls and sat them there, you know, and I just like, I looked at Ethan and I was like, you're not going to like this, you know, but there's a huge trap up here and turtle bones. And he was just like, no, he's like, no, there's not. And yeah. You know, just couldn't believe it. And we got up there. And I mean, it's, it's probably one of the worst days in the field I've ever had. I mean, I think we both were just like on the verge of, of just breaking down because it yeah. had been, been a long week. And to find that turtle along with five other big turtles that should have lived for a long time out there. I mean, you're talking, they could have lived, who knows, for another hundred years out Seriously. there. Seriously. Yeah. And, uh, it was, it was rough. And so, yeah, that trap, it ended up killing six of our alligator snappers. Um, mm -hmm. I think three or four of which we could identify because they had transmitters. So wow. <laughs> we started looking and looking through the pile of bones and we found more transmitters. Um, and not to mention, I mean, countless red ear slider shells, bones, um, at least like six, six to seven soft shells, like big spiny soft shell skulls we found. I mean, there were gar in there. There were other fish. I mean, it was just a trap of death. Yeah. I mean, you know, not just turtles killed fish and everything else. Who knows what else? And I mean, it was a, it was a pile. Yeah. Um, so obviously we called the conservation officer. Um, they came out, they look at it and take, take the skulls and things and take the trap and all that. And they ended up finding out who did it. <laughs> no way. Okay. Yeah, he lived right, like right there. Um, okay. There was a little boat launch where he would put in his boat, I guess. And they figured out who it was. And um, I guess what, you know, what he said had happened was he put out the trap before the flooding. And couldn't get to it. Couldn't get to it. Yeah. Um, 
which means that trap is out there for two months, two solid months of just things piling into it yeah. and dying. Um, and the thing that, well, number one, that trap is illegal in that stream. They're not, yeah. not allowed to hoop trap um, in that stream. Um, what, what do you even use? I, I only see you guys use hoop traps. I've never seen anyone because it's for turtles and stuff, right? Are people using yeah. hoop traps? Uh, they'll do them for fish too. Okay. Um, you know, but I'm not, I, I honestly don't know where it's legal to do that. I, I don't, I'm not up on my regulations for that. I just know that the conservation officer was like, this is not legal here. You, you can't, so, I mean, you can't use them to collect turtles at all in Illinois. Right. Yeah. Well, I think this guy, he was, he was trapping for fish. Okay. What he was hoping for. But regardless, you know, he couldn't do that. And the thing that bothers me about it is he's at, he's actually a farmer. He has farmland right next to the stream. You can't tell me that he didn't know that things were going to flood, that he wasn't watching and, and, and making sure. Cause I mean, he has farmland that yeah. he was farming right there, whatever. I mean, I don't know. Um, could have just been, you know, a terrible accident, but either way he killed six state endangered species. So yeah. Um, not good. I, I don't know exactly what happened as far as like legal stuff. I know he was facing a pretty big fine. Um, so well, yeah. it, it's just crazy to think about the repercussions that that has because uh, I don't know how many of those were females or whatever, but the the the, the time it takes for alligator snapping turtle a juvenile to get to sex age to, yeah. to lay eggs is a long, long time. And so long that time. just wiped out a ton. And not to mention if they're huge soft shells, those are all females too. So Absolutely. now all those females are out of the circulation. I don't know as much about ichthyology and gar and stuff like that, but one hoop net just impacted the environment for decades. Yeah, absolutely. And what's crazy is we can actually look at, at that impact by running the stats on it. Yeah. And Ethan did run the stats on it. And uh, by the way, uh, Ethan is Dr. Ethan Kessler. Uh, he did his, his PhD dissertation on this project. Um, he defended, I think, last spring during the pandemic. Uh, wow. During the pandemic, so. Um, but yeah, he ran the stats on it and you can look at the impact with that one trapping event and without it. And without that trapping event, we're approaching what, what we would call lam a lambda of one, which just means the population steady. You, yeah. you hope for a lambda greater than one, which means the population's growing. Reproducing, yeah. Yeah, but we were approaching that with that trapping event, this population goes extinct in 50 years. Jeez. I mean, that that's the effect that that one trap had on, on this reintroduction, not to mention, like you said, the other stuff that was in there. Red ear sliders probably going to do fine. Yeah. But uh, that doesn't mean that, <laughs> that doesn't still suck, you know? Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, as far as this reintroduction goes, that one trapping event kind of tanked it, you know, with, uh, with those big adults in there, we might've had a shot. Yeah. So. Is there, is there any uh, like hope in the, for this project? Are, are you, are you guys getting any more turtles or are you guys continuing the, the project or? Um, so we are, we have one more rear, year of releases. So this year is actually the last year of releases. Uh, the project is always like an eight year project, um, eight releases of turtles. So we will release more turtles this year. Um, and after that, it's kind of, it's kind of one of those things of, you know, do we want to continue? Um, yeah. It might be, unfortunately, it might be an exercise in what not to do, or um, we can kind of document like the success of this reintroduction and what we can do better in the future. I don't know. Um, I don't know if we've ran the if he then's re-ran the, the stats anytime like recently or not, but uh, I don't know. The, yeah. the goal after these eight years was to try and determine nesting, you know, are there nesting females? Um, yeah. At this point, the DNR would have to throw quite a bit more money at it. Cause we'd need, we need technicians down there all the time tracking females. We'd have to recapture as many as we could um, probably through trapping, try and trap, like really trap the stream and catch as many adult sized females as we could make sure they had transmitters on them and then have somebody track them constantly. Mm -hmm. You know, 
determine like, are they, are they nesting? Where are they nesting? What's the nest success? You'd have to probably cover nests. And I don't know, that's a big undertaking. And yeah. I don't know if it's even, honestly, I don't know if it's possible uh, yeah. without like GPS uh, trackers, GPS <laughs> transfers, just because knowing when they're going to, when they're out of the water, I mean, this is a species that like, there's not that many of them out there and they never leave the water. Yeah. They only leave the water to nest. I mean, right. Like, a couple hours. Yeah. So finding the nests after the turtle's gone would be impossible. Um, so I don't know. I don't know. There's a lot of things up in the air with it. I, I don't want to give up on it. It's all been a lot of work, you know, a yeah. lot of hard work for the past, you know, however many years, um, five years, five, six years at this point. Um, yeah. But I don't know. We're gonna have to we're gonna have to talk to the DNR uh, after this year's up and see where they are on and what they think, and they'll yeah. probably ask us what we think. And I think unless Ethan and I decide to continue doing it, it will probably end with us. I could be wrong, but yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I like I said, I hate to give up, but right now it feels like. A little bit of an exercise in futility, right? Yeah. One trapping event can, you know, totally tank the project. Um, we don't know how many trapping events are happening that we don't find. Right. Right. I, that guy could be throwing out traps again and catching turtles, and just we didn't find it. Yeah. So. I don't know. Man. Okay. That that was super heavy. Uh, I hope that the people hear that and like hey yeah. be mindful if you're using hoop traps maybe just don't use hoop trap maybe freaking just catch fish like normal right. uh well, be careful of your of your trout lines i know that's a huge yeah. one in the south the trout lines are always catching turtles on the throat and stuff like that yeah. or they're swallowing the hooks whatever uh but yeah if you're if you're a biology student consider taking up this project too consider the alligator snapping turtle in illinois like that would be yeah. awesome i i i have some alligator snapping turtles with permits yeah. um and i would love right now you can't breed them in illinois um, and they're way too small anyway. It's going to be like 20 years before they can they can breed. Right. But hopefully in that 20 years, they'll let us do that. And I would love to be part of the, some kind of project donating turtle eggs to uh, or the, the hatchlings and then releasing. Because that would be huge. That's like me. Like what I'm doing in my basement here is actually helping the state and these this animals. I really hope to do that. And I hope they start changing laws to, to let yeah. you uh, reproduce them. Yeah, that'd be awesome. That'd yeah. Be awesome. Well, let's talk Blandings turtles because I think that one is a little bit more hopeful. Hopefully, I don't know. Maybe you got some terrible stories about Blandings, but um, for for those listening, go look up a Blandings turtle. They're uh, like Seth said, they're super cute. They some people say they kind of look like a bullfrog turtle because they got these kind of bullfroggy eyes, but they have this beautiful yellow throat and speckled uh, shell, yellow speckles on them. Um, Seth, what's what's the word on like Blanding turtle conservation in Illinois? Is it are you, are you hopeful? Is it is it up? Is it down? Do you do you know about this or? Um, I'm probably not the best person to talk to about Blanding's just because I haven't worked on them a lot. Uh, being, like I said, from Southern Indiana and working a lot in Southern Illinois, I'm just getting into like the Northern species. But yeah, um, yeah, I think I think they're doing, I don't want to say they're doing better than we think, but I think they're doing a little bit better than we think um, mm -hmm. just because they are kind of hard to find sometimes. Yeah. Um, but that being said, they're not doing great. I mean, they are state endangered. Um, they've suffered from habitat loss, like everything else, habitat fragmentation. Um, so there is, there is, we have a lot of Blanding's work um, coming down the pipeline for the next few years. And hopefully, you know, that will inform us as to how they are doing. Um, we seem to find them in more places than we have in the past. Um, okay. so good. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. It's 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 kind of up in the air a little bit. Um, as of right now, I think um, the last I've seen, the best, like the biggest Blanding's population that we have, still has a ninety-five percent chance of going extinct in fifty oh, years gosh. without management. So yeah. if we continue to manage it, they will persist. Yeah. It's, but you always want to get you know these species to the point where. You don't have to. Right. Take They're just it. naturally. Yeah. And I think the issue with that is not enough habitat and too many raccoons. You know what yeah. I mean? Um, their, their nest survival's terrible. Um, without protecting all their nests, they're just going to get eaten by raccoons. 
Um, and without more space, more places for them to go. Um, yeah, it's, yeah. it's not good. So hopefully we learn a little bit more in the next few years and hopefully they're doing better than we think. Um, they're definitely doing better than the alligator salmon turtles. Yeah. So that's good. Um, but yeah. You've, I've, I've seen some pictures. You had this beautiful one, uh, on your Instagram that you're, that you're holding up. Uh, is that, is that one you found or is that, is, was that on a particular, like, I don't, don't say where it is or anything like that, but well, yeah, how'd was, you get, how'd you get hands on? It was, uh, that was at an, that was at one of the nature preserves, I think up in the Chicago area. Awesome. Uh, and that was the year I was actually doing bat stuff as well. But I went out with the previous herpetologist who worked here. Um, and he did, he did a ton of blaming stuff. Uh, his name is Jason Ross. If you wanted, if you wanted to talk to somebody who knows about the Blandings in the Chicago area, he'd be the guy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we went out with him. He was trapping, and we caught a couple Blandings. And that was the first Blandings I'd ever seen, which is awesome. Uh, nice. And I think we caught two, and I think that's the only two I've ever seen. So <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I'd love to get back to catching some. The neck, the place. So I'm actually trapping next week. Um, at another place, and I have a really good shot at catching blandings there. They actually sure. they actually reintroduce them there. So okay. um, if we don't catch any blandings, that may be really bad. <laughs> yeah. I might not bode well, but I think we probably will. Okay, uh, that's good. But yeah, that was at that was at a really nice big, uh, you know, I think it was a nature preserve. Um, can't remember exactly uh, where it was, but yeah, um, that was fun. They're they're really that's awesome. Uh, they, they definitely live up to, you know, the hype as far as like, yeah, they're just really cool. They're so cool. I love them. So my, my dad, uh, growing up, uh, similar story got into herpetology cause, cause of my dad, he actually, he lived in uh, Brookfield, Illinois and okay. growing up in the sixties, the he could sneak into the Brookfield zoo and he would sneak in and just look at the turtles like after hours as he lived right around the corner, which is hilarious. That's but awesome. so he would take me out looking and, um, he had this story uh, when he was in college. He's walking by the, the biologist room and he goes, hey, is that a Blandings turtle? And the biologist said, you're the first student in like 20 years to recognize that. So then that impressed on me like, OK, Blanding turtles are kind of important, kind of cool. And we would grow. Um, there's this place called the Willowbrook Wildlife Center. Uh, it might be in Glen Allen. I forgot where it's at, but they they do. Uh, they go out and they they capture wild uh Blandings and they incubate the eggs. And then they have behind glass uh, a glass uh, window, you can see all these baby Blandings turtles in their little tubs. So I grew up my whole life looking at these guys. And so I have a special love for them. I, I have a pet one that, that I bought and have permits for and everything like that. But um, hopefully it'll be another uh, species that, that uh, educational species that my, everyone I come in contact with is going to fall in love with this turtle as well. Um, I think what's, what's kind of cool about them is they're, I think they're probably pretty hard to poach. Um, the, if, yeah. if you, if you're really hard to find, they're going to live in a fen deep in some pocket of water in a fen. It's yeah. going to be really hard. You, you have to be a biologist to find them. And if you are, then you're not going to poach them anyways. Right. So it, unless it's accidentally, but I, I think that's one of the coolest things about them is you just can't, you can't find them unless they're nesting and that's really dangerous. They're going to get hit by a car or something, but. Right. Yeah, you're right. Because. The places that they live are usually like surrounded by dense vegetation, which they really like. And it's like some swampy, you know, area. And I mean, I guess if you're really dedicated, yeah, you could, you could go out and find one, but um, you have to probably trap and that'd be risky in and of itself, especially, especially in Illinois, because pretty much everywhere that they exist, we know about it. Yeah. And somebody, somebody's going to be, they're going to be wondering what you're doing. Yeah. Um, granted, not everything's on public lands. So you could, yeah. but, but yeah, I think they're going to be hard to find. So. Yeah. So, so for the listeners, um, go look up the Blanding's turtle. That's huge. And, uh, there's all sorts of like adopted turtle. Lake County has adopted turtle. DuPage County has probably adopted turtle where you can, you can donate money and they'll give you a name of a turtle. I think they send you a picture. You can go look at them and stuff. Um, get get involved in this. If you, uh, if you want to, and, and you're able to donate money to this and, uh, I love Blanding's turtles. They're amazing. Uh, real quick, as as we're leaving here, Seth, um, can you? What's it? Are, are turtles indicator species? I know a lot of uh, amphibians usually are. Um, is there anything like why? Why should people care about turtles? I guess. Yeah, and that's that's a tough question, right? Um, 
As far as indicator species, um, I don't know, not, not in the way that amphibians are, you know, where they're going to like absorb whatever pollutants there or like a turtles dioxide. are tough. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they could be, yeah, turtles are really tough. I mean, they, like I had a, a painted turtle the other day. I had no front, front legs, you know, yeah. out there being a turtle. Yeah. But uh, as far as why they should care, I would struggle with this, with this uh, question because to me it's like, because we can't, you know, we're, we're very intelligent species. And a lot of the reason that these, these animals are going extinct or they're in danger or whatever is because of us. And that's not, that's not to make us feel bad. It's just recognizing that because of progress, we have encroached on everything's habitat. Yeah. And this, this kind of goes for most things, right? Not just turtles. Um, we've, we've destroyed all the habitat and it's because of us that, that they're disappearing. And, you know, if any one species, like if the Blanding's turtle or the Massasauga or whatever in Illinois disappears, it's probably not going to have like drastic effects on the ecosystem. You know, that's, that's something that and I hate saying that because it's not what most people hear. Most time biologists will say, oh, well, if we lose a species, the ecosystem could crash. And it's like, yeah. maybe if we lost that species, then that species, then that species, then that species. Um, so you're probably not going to feel those effects but that animal won't exist. Yeah. And to me, that's enough. I don't know. Like I can't tell someone why to care um, because unfortunately a lot of people need some like reason they need it. Yeah. They need like, how does it affect me? Yeah. It gotta be um, pragmatic. Yeah. Yeah. And not everything's, not everything's gonna affect you directly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but if you, if you look at a blanding turtle and don't like, understand why you want to you want to protect it i don't know if i'm going to convince you you know yeah. what i mean because because they're really cool you know and and every species is is interesting and plays plays a part in the ecosystem and um if we go down that route of well this one doesn't really matter or it won't affect anything that's that's a slippery slope you know oh well it's just the blanding turtle okay well now it's you know, painted turtles, which would be insane, but yeah, seriously, now it's painted turtles. Now it's this, now it's that. And if we just keep saying that, well, after a bit, after a while, it's just going to be raccoons and, uh, <laughs> and, you know, we're going to lose all of our diversity and it's going to be, it's going to be just the generalists and the, the ones that can adapt that are, that yeah. are left, which is all, you know, nothing against them, you know, good on them. But, yeah. um, we get to live on this earth that has all this crazy diversity. And as of right now, it's the only one we know of. Yeah. So, um, man, that's, is, a, that's a, like a cosmic point right there, dude. That's really interesting. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's not just disappearing from, you know, this, it's disappearing from everywhere. From the universe. From if the this universe. turtle goes, there's no yeah. more blandings turtles that we know of. In the no, universe. Unless we're getting into like, you know, parallel alternate <laughs> or whatever, but that's too, that's, too that's, that's normally what we talk about in the podcast too. Yeah. I'm yeah. Gonna to, yeah. I'm gonna have to listen to some of those, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, for me, it's just, it's just the fact that we can, we're smart enough, you know, we're smart enough to, to recognize that we've maybe made some mistakes and mm -hmm. we can fix it. You know, it's not too late. It's not too late to fix these things um, and actually protect, protect our endangered species, maybe save them, you know, yeah. Yeah. So. No, I'm glad that you didn't, you, that you spoke the truth there and you didn't um, use some kind of campaign to, to twist the screws. But I, I, I like your point even more. It's the, like a beauty aspect. Hey, these are little beautiful gems. This turtle is amazing. Uh, go check them out and fall in love with them and then go protect them. Uh, so um, I'm a Christian. My Many of my audience members are Christians. And so for if you believe that God created this world, that you're made in his image, like you have an actual duty to care for this world. You're you're called to do that. That was the original call, Adam and Eve in the garden, go and have dominion over the world. And it wasn't cracking open turtles and throwing them in your pot. It right. was it was managing them and making the rest of the world look like the Garden of Eden. So, man, if you're a Christian, then you have a moral obligation to engage in this kind of conservation. If you're not, there's still plenty of other reasons from your own worldview why you should care for the Blanding's turtle, the alligator snapping turtle all the different fauna going on uh, in Illinois, in Arkansas, and to the stretches of the of the universe or the, the world here, which is unique. Uh, Seth, man, thanks so much for coming on the podcast and, and schooling us on this. 
I, I hope you come back, man, because you have you do have this. You're a, a naturalist in the in the uh, nature sense, um, yeah. and I think that's really huge. So you can talk about it a lot, man. This is really really fun. It's a it's a different change of pace for my audience, but this is the kind of conversations I want to continue to have because I think what we just talked about may have some ripple effects in ecology, man. That would be huge. That'd be awesome. And you know, I like I said, I appreciate you having me on. This is this was fun. First podcast I've ever talked on, so I'm really excited about that and. Yeah, I, I'd love to be back and and talk about some some other things. You know, prairie plants. You talked about loving prairie plants. I I really gotten into them recently. So, yeah, that'd be great. Awesome, man. Awesome. Well, um, okay. So, Seth, uh, where can people find your work? Uh, is it is it the best place to Instagram bearded biologist or what do you think? Yeah, um, at the beard biologist on Instagram is kind of where I'm most active. Um, I have my Instagram automatically uploaded to Twitter, so you could look up at Seth Lagrange, and they'd be on there as well. If you're more of a, a Twitter person, um, it's just going to literally be like my Instagram post on there. I also yeah. have a Facebook page, um, same kind of thing, automatically uploads to Facebook. Instagram's kind of where I, you know, what I use to then add to those. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I, mean, yeah. I have. I have just a shameless plug. I do have an Etsy shop where you could you could buy a shirt like this. Oh, that's awesome, dude! That's not shameless. That's amazing. Um, this is actually, this is actually a piece of artwork that I made. Uh, it's wow. scratch board of an alligator salmon turtle skull. You can buy the print. You can buy the shirt. Um, if you've been on my Instagram, I also had a poster of box turtles, which people really liked. Yeah. So you can find that stuff on there if you're interested in art. Um, but yeah, Instagram is kind of the the big one for me. That's, that's what I like. I've always enjoyed taking photos. So that's kind of what I've gravitated towards. I'm trying yeah. to be a little bit more active on there with, with stories. I've and, noticed that lately, dude. And I know I, yeah, I hope it, you don't yeah. get uh, sick of that because I, I love that. I love following along. And so I'm, it's like, I'm with you there uh, in a sense, as you're doing your trapping, you're showing different stuff. So I actually really appreciate that. So please keep that up and, and for everyone go follow him and, and follow along the, the journey, man. It's really fun to see that. No, I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Yeah, Seth, real quick. Sorry, did you say that you? That's your artwork on your shirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can, can I see it one more time? That's so cool, dude. Um, so that that is like part of being a naturalist is actually doing the drawings as well. Like the old school guys would do all these amazing, beautiful, yeah, uh, um, botanical art kind of stuff. Yeah, there's a lot. It's amazing how many like biologists are also artists. Um, yeah. Not all of them, but yeah, like a lot of times. That's what it was. A naturalist, they drew the animals because they couldn't take a photo of them, right? Like yeah. all, all the time. Um, so yeah, that's that's something that I find really interesting. Yeah, I that's enjoy awesome. It, so awesome. All right. Well, um, hopefully we can continue continue this conversation. But for now, it's going to have to do it. This has been Parker's Pensies, and as always, all glory to God. <laughs>